Hey everyone, how are you guys doing? If you're new here, my name is Danny Christine. I'm a childcare business owner, consultant, and a digital content creator on childcaresites.com. On childcaresites.com, you could access video courses to help you start or grow your childcare business. You could get website design services and many resources for childcare professionals such as yourself. You could also get access to free webinars such as the replay of one that you are about to watch. If you subscribe to childcaresites.com, you'll be notified every time we're having a new webinar or any other sort of event or exclusive offer. So be sure to head on over to childcaresites.com and subscribe. As I just mentioned, you are about to watch the replay for a webinar that I just hosted live alongside Don Martini, who is an HR and a early care and learning specialist at Ronald V. McGuckin and Associates. Dawn went into a lot of details about policies and forms and handbooks and all of that kind of legal stuff surrounding the current public health emergency that we're all facing right now known as coronavirus. Specifically how coronavirus impacts and relates to childcare businesses and what we should be putting into place within our policies as childcare business owners. The webinar is about an hour long. Feel free to pause and come back as needed. I really hope that you enjoy and I really hope that it answers a lot of questions that you might have surrounding this topic. We'll get started in just a minute. I know that we have only an hour to get through tons of questions. So Dawn, whenever you're ready, you can just let me know. Okay. This is Dawn Martini. As many of you know already who have registered, her bio is was on the registration page. She is an HR and early care um, an education specialist from Ron McGuckin and Associates. I happen to know Dawn because we use their services in my child care program and I love them. So if I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that they'd be happy to take on more, <laughs> more clients, right? Oh, sure. Always happy to take on more. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. And um, thank you for joining this evening. This is my fifth hour of Zoom calls today, so um, please excuse me um, if I am uh, stuttering over my words, but there's a lot. We've been doing Zooms left and right and over and over again um, with all of this COVID-19 stuff going on, and it seems to be the new trending um, way to get the message out there and um, to, to reach folks and do some professional development. I had some questions sent over to me already, and um, I want to make sure that we get to all those questions. So if you see me looking down, it's because I have those out here on my, my desk in front of me. And um, a lot of them have to do with documentation related to waivers and liability with opening up or expanding you know the care that you've been giving if you've remained open this entire time um, as we kind of enter either a new phase they like to call things phases here in pennsylvania where i am or if um, you're looking to reopen in the next academic year and you're looking to update policies and procedures the first question um, references the idea of a waiver of liability form that you may have parents fill out that protects you from liability um, if a child uh, contracts this virus or any other for that matter while in care at your center okay and the question is very well written i have to say and obviously they've been um, speaking to an attorney because it says that you know they've had another attorney tell them that having a waiver of liability isn't really worth anything because there are certain things that you can't 
have the parents sign liability away from. And that is very correct. Um, I am not an attorney. Our office is a law office. Ron McGuckin is the lead attorney in our office. I've been with him for the last 20 years. My expertise is in the administration and HR um, side of childcare, but I've been doing this long enough and do these trainings enough that I can say that this attorney is correct. There are certain things that you cannot waive liability for or have the parents waive liability. That being said, your liability with regard to the COVID virus is not any more um, prevalent um, than any liability for a child who gets pink eye or the flu or the chicken pox while in attendance at your program or hand and mouth, um, uh, you know, those kinds of viruses that are easily transmittable and, and run rampant through child care centers um, at different times of the year and things like that. It's a virus. It's a virus just like any other virus. So the idea of needing a waiver for coronavirus is kind of silly, okay? Um, that being said, there is some information and there is some, I guess, communication that we should have with our parents as well as with our staff regarding um, them acknowledging and disclosing to you or agreeing to disclose to you um, certain behavior and certain conduct because this is a different kind of virus. Um, it is highly contagious um, and it is also um, in a certain group of the population, it's extremely serious, okay? And even though it's not always extremely serious for the small children um, and often they get it and you don't even know that they have it, there is also the complicating after effects that we're seeing in another extremely small subset of the population um, that looks like Kawasaki disease. So it's all kind of very scary, right? And we don't want that to happen at our center. So since there are gonna be new protocols and at least while we're still in the public health emergency phase of things, it is a good idea to have some kind of document that the parents and the staff are going to sign. And we're calling that document an acknowledgement and a disclosure form. We currently have two of those available and Danielle has said that she's going to uh, attach the link to those um, to the recording of this and the archive of it so that you can get that. I'm gonna share my, um, oh, Okay, I was going to share a screen, but I don't, I'm not technically a host. Oh, you can do that? Okay, yeah. give me access. Yeah. I'm going to, I'll show you where you can find it too. Um, so all this Zoom stuff is new to me um, as <laughs> well. So what you can do and can't do. Oh, okay, I can do, that's quick. All right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick right now. Hold on. Boop, boop, boop. Here we go. Let's share this. Um, on our website, Ronald McGuckin and Associates, we have... Um, and this is our website, which is childproviderlaw.com. And we have this new badge that has been entered here um, on our homepage. So you don't really have to go that far. And if you click on that badge, you're going to come to um, several different documents. And the COVID-19 Acknowledgement and Disclosure, there are two versions of those that are available on our website. And these are free, these are open doc files. And the reason why we have them as an open Word doc file is so that you can edit it and amend it to make it applicable to your state or county restrictions that may be more strict or less strict than other places, okay? It also will depend upon what you want to do because there's a lot of different ways that we can do the CDC guidelines. So we have the very strict restrictions version of this um, that initially came out when people were open for just emergency essential workers and we were really just learning about this and kind of processing it. Just last week, we released the moderate restrictions version excuse me, as a lot of places have um, 
been open as a lot of states, particularly Florida and Texas, um, have eased restrictions and have allowed um, more public recreational places to open. We're still up here in the Northeast, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of different types of businesses and recreational facilities closed, even with stay at home orders being lifted. So this is where you can find these documents. You can put your letterhead on them. You do not have to credit us in any way. Um, you can edit and amend it to make it work for your program. What you're gonna find, I'm gonna open the moderate one right now. Um, oh, that's not good that that show, okay, there we go. Um, so the moderate restrictions, okay, and um, if we go down, we have an employee version of this, okay, that your employees would sign. And then if, and again, law office, we like everything to be signed. We like there to be witnesses. And then if you go into the child and the family version, it's basically the same information that the parent, uh, or excuse me, that the employee signs, um, but they sign it on behalf of their child. And it goes over a lot of the basic things that um, the CDC guidelines talk about. It talks about, you know, screening the children when they first come into the building. It talks about screening the staff when they first come into the building. Um, and then, you know, every two hours or so thereafter. A lot of centers are doing it every two hours. Some other centers are doing it when they first arrive at lunchtime, after nap time. Um, and depending upon how late into the afternoon you're open, they might do it, you know, one more time around four or five o'clock um, if you're going to be open a little bit later into the evening. So it talks about all of those basic things. Um, the biggest thing, and, and this is one of the other questions, I just want to go back down here to my list. Um, one of the other questions that we had was about parents who insist upon having access to the center. Okay, I think that's on the list here unless that was another client that emailed. Um, but we're getting a lot of the same questions everywhere. Um, but parents not having access to the center and having like a, an entryway drop off place. Um, you know, and if parents are insisting on coming in, do you have to allow them? Initially, because it is a CDC recommendation that as few people as possible be in the building, um, and even though parents have the right to immediate access, and that's a licensing regulation, very technically, you're telling them to stay out, but if they need to come in for a, a reason, they, they have to kind of be let in. Um, but it is that balance of understanding that, you know, they shouldn't just be in the center and waltzing around and doing, you know, their normal pick up or drop off routine with the children. Um, and then anybody who comes in your building obviously should be having a, a mask on um, if it is a, you know, an adult, um, you know, coming in um, to pick up their child. So we go through all of these standard things. We talk about um, wearing the masks. Again, it's optional in a lot of places, even though it's recommended by the CDC. Um, but you have a place here where you can tell parents and you can tell staff what the expectation is for wearing a mask. Um, then we get into some of the part that's about the disclosure, about the communication. And we get into like the seven, um, the eight, nine, and 10 here. And in the staff, it's in the, um, in the, in the same area of the document. And we look at, um, having restrictions on how the parents and the children and the staff will function outside of the center in you know the other hours of the day and talking about them being you know selective with how they gather socially and maintaining appropriate social distancing and um, you know, following guidelines for indoor community recreation facilities as well as outdoor recreation activities. Um, you can, even if your state doesn't um, have that many restrictions, like, you know, with the, the beaches being open and pools being open, um, and other indoor facilities, you know, I keep thinking and going back to, you know, all of these little indoor jumpy trampoline places that kids love to go to and parents love to take their kids to so that they get some energy out. Um, and, 
those being indoors and overcrowded and um, maintaining social distance in those places and having the kids not touch stuff. Um, and so you can decide if you want to say, listen, if you're going to come to the center and you're going to bring your children to the center, you can't do these things. Yeah, movie theaters might be open, but we don't want you sitting in a two and a half hour movie with your kids indoors at this time if you want to come to the center. So that's why this is an open document. So you can kind of move and shift that bar to what you sensibly you know, want and think for your program. Um, we talk about this um, as keeping your circle as small as possible because by coming into the center, going back to work, if you had been teleworking or you weren't working at all, that expands exponentially how many people you are exposed to and how many people you are exposing. So these guidelines are to kind of keep that as small as possible in this like initial phase so we can kind of see how things go, right? Um, if you just kind of open it up, it's like a floodgate and it all just kind of comes rushing through and you have to be careful about that. So you can work with this language in this document to make it sensible for what you have going on in your area and what you want for your business as far as the restrictions go, okay? And you are able, and this is one of the biggest questions we get, you are able to tell your employees and you are able to tell your clients what they can and cannot do in the hours outside of work and or care in order to work for you and or come to your program. All right, everybody's like, well, how can I do that? Um, because these things are not, um, you couldn't tell somebody that they can't go to um, the hospital if they need to go, um, or you couldn't tell somebody that, and, and I know this is like controversial right now, but um, you couldn't tell someone that they can't go to a protest um, because you have the constitutionally protected right to do that, but you do not have a constitutionally protected right to go to a movie theater. Okay, um, and so I know some people have a really hard time distinguishing those two things, but um, you know, that's where um, those kinds of, um, you know, issues end up falling. Now, if let's say an employee does go to a protest um, and you say, listen, you got to keep social distance and, you know, there really is no way to keep a social distance at a protest, you can have them stay home and self-quarantine, but they would then qualify for leave under the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act because they're being recommended to stay home for 14 days because of potential exposure and you're requiring them to do that. So, um, you know, again, you can flex and, and bend these, these restrictions. So this document, it also then goes into the disclosure piece where we ask the parents and or the employees to communicate with you if they know anybody um, has been in contact with somebody who is presumed positive or is positive. The biggest pushback we get there is, oh, well, that's a HIPAA violation, okay? You can't make me tell you if one of my coworkers is positive, or you can't make me tell you if somebody in my household is presumed positive. And the answer to that is, yes, I can. Because I'm not asking you to say, oh, Don Martini at my office has coronavirus. I'm asking you to say, somebody at my work was tested positive for coronavirus. There's a difference. Also, if you want to be very technical about things, and in the law, we like to be technical, um, HIPAA actually has no place and no effect and no application in a child care setting. Um, HIPAA involves the law, if you actually read it, and I have, um, actually applies to the electronic storage and transfer of medical information at healthcare in, uh, institutions. Um, so it's for doctor's offices. Um, it is for hospitals. It is for long-term care facilities that their business is medical information. So HIPAA has nothing to do, you're not even required to comply with HIPAA at a child care center because it doesn't apply to you. 
but these are confidentiality issues, which is similar to HIPAA, but it's not the HIPAA law that people like to, oh, this HIPAA, you can't make me do this. Um, and since you're not asking someone to disclose who has coronavirus, just that someone does or is presumed positive in their household or at work, um, it's not a confidentiality violation either, okay? Now, what do you do with that information once you know it? Because this document doesn't say, oh, if somebody at your work tested positive, you and your child can't come to the center. It's gonna open up a conversation because it's going to depend, let's say it's a family and it's the parent, um, I had a client call me and under this document, a father called her in the middle of the day and said, listen, I just want to let you know that somebody at my work tested positive um, for coronavirus. And the director said, okay, thank you. Um, who was it? You know, who, like who in relation to you was it? Were you in contact with them? Did you work directly with them? Did you share a cubicle with them? Um, and you know, how much contact did you have with the person? And, and what's your place of business doing about it and making you do? And the gentleman was a front desk um, receptionist at a hotel. The person that tested positive was a guest at the hotel with whom he had no contact. Um, and after evaluating it and working with the health department, the hotel had any of the um, housekeeping staff that worked in um, the room or on the floor, I actually think, where the, the guest stayed. And the um, employee that did the, the um, registration at the desk with the person, they all quarantined, but nobody else did. Okay, and then everybody was given a test. So with that information, we said, listen, there's a very low risk that he was even anywhere near this person and that he was in contact with the person. Um, at this point in time, we don't really have to do anything. Now, if he was the front desk receptionist that was then told to quarantine at home for 14 days, um, the child would have also then needed to stay home with him for 14 days and not come to the center. So the disclosure part is about the conversation and using that information to come to a decision. It's not a, you know, black and white, yes or no, um, they're going to have to be out of the program and the parents are going to be mad about it. It's, it's a conversation to see what the health department and the other employer is doing. Okay. Um, you also have to remember that your staff have other people in their household that are also going to work and being exposed. So if you live in, you know, if your lead teacher lives in a household with somebody who went to work and shared a cubicle with somebody who tested positive and you know there's that person that your employee lives with is ordered to stay home for 14 days your staff members probably going to have to stay home with them as well because they're going to be exposed by being in the household with them uh, so again it's all about those conversations and asking parents and informing parents and your staff that they need to in inform you of this. So this is the document that we have in place of the waiver. And I'm going to back out of this right now. Um, Don, sorry about that. Uh, yes. Someone wants to know, does FERPA apply to what you were just discussing? The um, family educational rights? And no, because you guys are not educational institutions in most states because you're not licensed by the state. Um, you're not licensed by the state department of education okay so a lot of things that um folks jump on with with um comparing us to educational institutions and laws that apply to agencies um that are part of the department of education um we need to make sure that we understand that they don't they don't always um translate to us Okay, so no, it would not. All right, um, let me just go over here. The other thing I want to let you know about too is our Facebook page. We have been constantly, and I'm gonna have to scroll down a little ways to get to it, um, and it's gonna have to load, but we have been 
posting links to really great resources, um, especially with talking about staff that um, may need to stay home in quarantine because of exposure and the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act paid leave. Um, so we have some links here to that. We also um, have various links um, to different states um, with their um, licensing regulations or emergency declarations that come out. So this is a great place. And then we always link um, our forms to this as well. So it's been a great place for folks to get some information um, on you know, these forms and these topics that are here on our, on our Facebook page. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. Let me go back. Um, and I wanna just see what kinds of um, questions, if any questions popped up because I think Oh, it's in a different little place. Here we go. Um, so what happens if a staff's family member has been exposed and is told to quarantine? Does that ha staff member have to quarantine as well? And I think I did just, um, and what about the children that staff member works with, okay? Um, and yes, there is more information on our website about the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. That in and of itself could be a three hour um, uh, webinar. So I will try to get to some questions about that. But just in and of itself, that um, has been a really big topic and that might be something we do hopefully here in the future. Um, but with regard to you know the staff member having to quarantine, yes, and any children that they have living in their household obviously would have to quarantine. If they're just quarantining out of an abundance of precaution because they potentially were exposed to somebody or there's a reasonable um, correlation that, you know, with somebody who has tested positive or is presumed positive because still in a lot of places we can't actually get tests, so that's fun, um, then if it's just for a precaution, then the health guidelines right now aren't requiring centers necessarily to close for any period of time for any deep cleaning and or notifying the parents and the staff, okay? Um, however, if the employee does test positive as a result of that exposure, that then changes the, the notification requirement where we would be notifying parents that, listen, a teacher was at the center, um, she was exposed to somebody, we sent her home immediately, or even maybe the teacher had symptoms, we sent her home immediately, excuse me, and um, she was told to quarantine or self-isolate for 14 days, her test came back positive. Um, and we would then have to talk with the health department because you have to notify your health department. And um, in some cases, you're going to be told that you have to close. Um, it's anywhere from three to five days that you have to close and you have to deep clean and then you can reopen, all right? If though, for example, you have a staff member who um, because of, um, potential exposure started quarantining and they're at home and it's you know well into you know seven or ten days into the quarantine they haven't been at the center and then they test positive because they then start having symptoms they've been out of your center for a long enough period of time that it is likely that the health department won't require you to close your center to deep clean okay um, especially with all the enhanced cleaning procedures that we have so there isn't a hard and fast rule for every single situation it's something that once it happens um, that's when the conversations start happening about okay how much exposure did you have how much risk is it do you have symptoms when was the last time you were in the center? And we kind of go down the list from there to determine what to do, all right? And for those of you who are in areas that there, you don't have a health department in your county, somebody from the state is should be monitoring this. Um, and I'm not talking about licensing because licensing is gonna say, well, we don't know, you're gonna have to ask the CDC or you're gonna have to ask the health department. So, um, 
it may also involve you just getting in contact with the employee um, and getting a note or guidance from the employee's physician or whoever advised the employee to quarantine and stay home. All right, I wanna move along here with the questions. Um, yes, so what if the parents do not agree with um, the guidelines on drop off and pick up for the new year? If the parents don't um, agree to the guidelines and the new procedures, they don't come to the center. Okay, that's very simple. Um, we have, um, I was just on the phone with um, a center in Delaware yesterday um, where, you know, there is a parent that's putting up a big, you know, huff and puff about um, the HIPAA and signing the disclosure and they want to write on it and change things and, you know, they want to put their comments on it. And the answer is no. Um, this is our document. These are the procedures that we've put in place to keep not only your children safe, but our staff safe. And you aren't entitled to come into our community. This isn't like public education um, where there's an entitlement. And even we see, you know, with public education right now, um, you know, they've completely, you know, rearranged and changed everything uh, for this last semester of the school year, um, even in a, an environment where people are entitled to an education. So, you know, if parents don't like your procedures, if parents don't like um, what's going on, they don't have to come back. And I know that that is hard for some of us to say, um, and it's hard um, to hear um, that you're allowed to say it because we're all in the early care and education field. We're all so darn warm and fuzzy um, and we're so nice and we're so accommodating to everybody. But the bottom line is what you're doing, your policies, your procedures are there because one, it's your business and you get to set it up the way you want. And two, um, you're doing these things to keep people safe in, in this COVID era. So if parents don't like it, they don't come back, okay? Um, I'm gonna put this Q&A up here again. It is difficult to get answers. Um, from the health department, um, it, it's kind of one of those things like calling the IRS and, and asking them a question and they're like, oh, you know, they don't want to put anything writing, they don't want to say anything because then they're going to be held accountable to it. Um, so, you know, it's really hard, but Again, you can also then access a, a doctor. Maybe you have a doctor that you um, you could personally ask your own physician, or um, you could say to the staff member or to the family, like, listen, you need to get, you know, you need to get some. We need to have some discussion with um, your physician to figure out what the best way to handle this is. Um, and again, it's not as big of an issue if somebody isn't showing symptoms as opposed to when they are. So it's part of an ongoing conversation and just being honest. We're not gonna get ahead of community spread with this if um, we're not honest, okay? Another question that came in real quick was, must all toddlers wear a mask and can classes mix? Those are licensing questions. Um, those are not questions for me. What I have seen as far as licensing regulations are, um, are they're as varied as the states are varied in handling this, okay? There are some states that are requiring all children over the age of two to wear a mask whenever they're in the center, um, except for eating and nap time. There are other states that leave it up to the discretion of the provider and the parents, okay? Um, so, in it, toddlers, you know, toddlers are anybody that it's one to about three, we call a toddler. Well, anybody under the age, uh, over the age of two can wear a mask, but two and under can't. Um, it's not recommended um, that toddlers wear masks that, I, I, I don't want to use toddlers, excuse me. The CDC does not recommend that anyone two years of age or under, okay, and that would include anybody until their third birthday wear a mask, all right? Um, any child who has any kind of respiratory issues um, 
is not required to wear a mask. So if you have a four-year-old child who has asthma, they're not going to wear a mask. Um, so it, that's the CDC guidelines. But what your state requires, I know um, California is requiring all children over the age of two to wear masks and all staff. But then I know other states um, like um, Florida that says it's really up to um, the business as well as the parents whether or not you wear masks at the child care facility. So that's not really a question I can answer. I can help you find the answer um, for your specific state and your particular location if you need. Okay. Um, moving down my list of pre um, questions. Um, I have one, Don. Yes, Danny, go ahead. Um, it's not, it was someone that had recently registered, so it's not on the list that you have. But uh, Queen wants to know if you have a worker that moved to another state plus one that does not want to come back to work, what do you do? You can't make, can you make them come back? Okay, so as far as an employee who moved to another state, I'm not exactly clear on that question, like meaning that while you were closed, they they just they up and moved. Okay, um, I don't know if that's that's what you're asking. Um, as far as the employees who are nervous about coming back, like whether you've laid them off or and they're collecting unemployment or you have them just at home and you're paying them to stay home and not report to work. Maybe you're having them do some, some um, professional development and, and telework stuff at home that they can do. Maybe you're paying them with PPP money, um, you know, all of those various things. When you call the staff back, um, if um, they refuse to come back, Okay, they are basically abandoning their position. Okay, and you would need to document that and send them a letter. If they have um, been collecting unemployment, you also can notify your state unemployment agency that you recalled them from layoff or from furlough, whatever you called it, that you offered them hours and a position and they refused and their unemployment will stop. Okay, now it may take some time because the documentation and so many people are out on unemployment and there's so much paperwork that everything's delayed. But the way it's supposed to work is that you call them back, they either come back or they don't, and if they don't, they go off unemployment. That's the rules, okay? Now, if they have one of the qualifying reasons, and here's our Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, okay? And again, this is like a three hour lecture. I'm gonna to try to do it in about eight minutes. Um, under the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, employees are entitled to two different kinds of paid time off. One is two weeks of full-time pay, up to 80 hours, okay? Um, for six qualifying reasons, okay? Those six qualifying reasons, and um, back on our website in that coronavirus little area is a whole handout that summarizes all of the qualifying reasons, all right? So if they have one of the six qualifying reasons um, under the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, and they, I'm just trying to pull a paper out here that I have in front of me. Um, it includes that they do not have care for their own child because their own child's school camp, um, you know, the nanny that comes to their house, is not available due to the coronavirus um, whole, you know, public health emergency. That they themselves or someone in their household, whether it's their spouse, their child, their parent, anybody in their household is told to quarantine because of potential exposure, whether they themselves have symptoms or are sick. Um, and you know those reasons are all laid out um, that create the total of six reasons. Um, they are entitled to two weeks of paid leave. All right. Now this is for employers who ha or who have um, 500 or fewer employees, and for employers that have 50 or fewer employees, um, 
there is an option to um, be exempt from the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, but there is no process for doing that. And the law is written so that you have to show um, that you would be eminently um, close, you would be harmed, you would be substantially harmed or in eminent risk of closing or losing your business by offering this paid leave. If you are a small enough center where you only have one or two employees, I could see making an argument that giving someone leave would close your business because you don't have a replacement employee. But once you get into having eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 employees, having one or two employees go out on leave when you have reduced enrollment right now anyway, isn't going to eminently you know, be an eminent threat to closing your business. This is also not going to be a financial burden for anyone because the um, paid leave is underwritten by a 100% dollar for dollar payroll tax credit. So if I go out on paid leave and Danielle has to pay me $1,000 for those two weeks in my payroll, she gets to deduct $1,000 from her payroll tax liability the next time she pays payroll taxes to the federal government. So if her payroll tax liability was $10,000 for that pay period, but she paid me $1,000 in pay, um, paid leave, she'd only owe $9,000. And your accountant um, should be able to direct you to the forms, the payroll tax forms that have the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act information on them and how to document um, that information, okay? And um, the other type, there was two I said, types of paid leave is there's only one reason, one qualifying reason to get the second type of Family First Coronavirus Relief Act paid leave. And that is for um, needing to stay home because your child's school camp or child care center is closed. And that entitles you to 12 weeks of paid leave the first two being unpaid, but remember, it was also a qualifying reason to get the two weeks of full pay. So they would combine and the first two weeks would be full pay. And then the subsequent up to 10 weeks would be two thirds of their pay. All right. Now I'm going to go um, send you back to our Facebook page. And since I kind of took it down, let me see here. Um, oh, I didn't take it down. Oh, let me go back and to the Zoom here, and I'm gonna share my screen again. I thought I, I closed out of everything. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back here. And if you scroll down on our Facebook page, this, um, and it's gonna open this document, the um, SRAM, the, um, the HR organization that we belong to, and I recommend that if you are in charge of HR in your organization, um, you, consider joining this and, and looking at it, but they have these awesome um, downloadable documents for requesting um, the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act leave. And when I saw these, I was like, well, I don't even need to create forms. I I'm just gonna link these on our site. Um, and they have all of the qualifying reasons. Look, you see all the six qualifying reasons. Um, they have to then certify, and then here's the statement supporting the leave. They either um, certify that it's due to a government issued quarantine or isolation order. They certify that their health care provider told them that they needed to quarantine. Okay, here they have to give the name of the school um, or the child care provider um, that is closed so that you can verify that, um, the name and the age of the children. I had someone fill this out today and she listed a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a no-month-old. It must be an infant. She didn't put, she just put a zero year. She didn't put how many months. Um, but she only listed here the elementary school. Well, school is over anyway in most, most places. So that doesn't help me. School was always going to be closed. So what is the camp or summer care arrangement that is closed that you can't come back to work for? And what about, and, and it really only needs to be care for one of the children. Um, 
you know, the other children would just then stay home with her um, there. So these forms, like I said, um, are from um, the SRAM here. And um, we have that linked on our, um, on our Facebook page. I keep getting different um, boxes here popping up. All right. So that's one of those resources that we put there that will help you um, navigate the reasons and uh, why employees may be um, may be out and asking for leave. So they can't just say, oh, well, I want to stay home because I'm scared or because I'm worried. Um, they have to certify one of these qualifying reasons in order to be out on the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act leave, okay? Once they see that they have to provide this documentation, um, some of that whining or um, cautiousness kind of goes away. Also, when recalling your employees, one of the ways that you can maybe tamper some of this is to be very direct and specific that, especially if they're collecting unemployment already, that you will be notifying unemployment that they were recalled to work as of July 1st or whatever day you're gonna recall them to work. Um, and that will stop their unemployment, okay? Um, and again, if they have qualifying reasons to remain either out on unemployment or um, receive Family First Coronavirus Relief Act leave, then again, they have to fill out the documentation, all right? Um, if, if you call them back to work and they get the, the paid leave, they're actually back at work and getting pay. So no, they cannot collect unemployment as well as get paid leave, all right? Once you're called back to work, okay, um, you're back to work. If you go out on vacation or you use your PTO or you go out on Family First Coronavirus um, paid leave, then you're back at work and you're being paid. Just like if you had a PPP loan and you were paying your employees while you were closed, they couldn't collect unemployment because they were still receiving pay, all right? And very technically, if a paid leave is available, that has to be used before they can use unemployment. The complicating factor here, though, is that under the CARES Act, which is the second piece of legislation that came out, having a child stay home or, or being required to stay home um, because you're at high risk um, was a qualifying reason to get the pandemic unemployment assistance. So, um, you know, it's just kind of a balancing act between those two. And if an employee is eligible to collect unemployment versus just two thirds of their pay, most employers would just leave them on unemployment at this point, simply because um, unemployment isn't being charged against your account right now while we're in the pandemic unemployment assistance um, situation, okay? Um, if a staff member is not coming to work over the summer because their children are done with public school and they are not putting them in any kind of program, are they entitled to unemployment? It can't just simply be a, a decision not to put them in any kind of program. They have to show that the program that they were going to put them in is closed. So let's say here in Philadelphia, um, some of the rec, summer rec programs are opening, okay? Um, but they have extremely reduced capacity, okay? For example, the school district I'm in um, out here in Bucks County usually has two locations um, for their summer camp that they host on site, okay? And this year, because of the virus, they're only doing one location, and that location is the smaller of the two. So it's only actually like 40% capacity. Um, so they can't just decide that, oh, well, I want to stay home for the summer. If they had already um, worked it out with you that they would be off for the summer, then that was their choice to take the summer off. So it's really about them proving and certifying on those documents that I showed you from SRAM that they have a qualifying reason 
um, to either remain on unemployment under the CARES Act or get paid um, under the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, okay? Um, you got a PPP loan and you're supposed to rehire everybody, but I will not need a floater. Um, okay, so the, and I have not had a chance to review these guidelines, but the PPP loan and the forgiveness guidelines have changed within the last week. There was a new um, um, bill that was passed um, sometime at the beginning of last week, I believe, that extended the PPP loan from eight weeks out to 24 weeks. So you have 24 weeks to spend it and you do need to have everybody back, but that counting that has changed. Also, if you, if for the, the person who asked the question earlier, they had a staff member that moved. Well, you don't have to bring that exact staff member back. You just have to bring somebody back. All right, so I can't I, I can't get into the specifics, um, Caroline, it, unfortunately, because uh, with the PPP, because I have not had time to review the new all the details of the new um, law that just came out last week. Uh, the specifics I do know is that it's extended out from eight to twenty four weeks. Um, the forgiveness is still the same what you can use um, and what qualifies for forgiveness is still the same, but how that's calculated over the 24 weeks and the counting employees, um, I have just have not gotten into those details just yet. But um, if you pay attention to um, our website and then another one, and, and, and Danielle, maybe you could put up the link to the Association for Early Learning Leaders, which is um, www.earlylearningleaders.org. That's where Ron is doing a, a, a ton of free webinars. Um, I have done some as well. They also have this really cool thing called Small Talk. It is Tuesday afternoons and Thursday evenings. And the Thursday evenings is like a cocktail party. Apparently it's extremely fun, um, but also very informative. Um, and um, they have a lot of, they are, um, <laughs> they are fun. I haven't done any of them because they're past my bedtime. Um, <laughs> But actually, uh, you know, not this time of year because of everything that's going on. I find myself staying up all night. But um, I haven't popped on to the eight o'clock at night one. Um, but actually, I think it's nine o'clock Eastern time and it's eight o'clock Texas time because it comes out of Texas. And they have different speakers. But out of our office, Ron has really taken the lead on the PPP loan stuff. And I've taken the lead on the unemployment stuff. So that's really where I think those questions will be better answered for you. Um, I'm going to scroll through this list because I think the last question I have, and it's kind of a lot of them rolled into one. Um, should I limit my hours and my days? Um, would, should I do a surcharge, a COVID-19 surcharge on my tuition? Um, should I pay my employees hazard pay during this time? Um, and should I require antibodies testing? Um, so, and, and this one also had a question about the waiver, but I think we dealt with that. So with regard to the antibodies testing, I, um, I have an 18 year old son who um, I made him get a job because he was driving me crazy. Um, and he works at the local grocery store. Um, and he's a bit, you know, he's a baseball player, high school, he's constantly busy and with nothing to do, he was driving me insane. So I thought, listen, I'm gonna get him the antibodies test just so that I have peace of mind because he's in a grocery store every single day working and you know, teenage boys aren't the cleanest, you know, things on the planet. So, um, you know, I was like, Let, it, it'll make me feel better. So I called and I asked about it. And um, what I was told, and I, I trust my physician's office, um, and some, um, some articles I have read since asking, and I've asked probably within the last four or five weeks since the antibodies tests came out, uh, is that one, antibodies tests right now are only 50% accurate. <laughs> well, I can guess, you know, 50% whether I think he had it or not, okay? And I actually really do think he did have it back in February. Um, so what what is the antibody test really going to tell me if it's only 50% accurate? It's like, you know, throwing a spoon, like, oh, ah, okay. Um, 
And then in addition to that, they aren't actually as readily accessible as they seem to be, okay? I know it says that they're at CVS and you know these Rite Aid pharmacies and you can go and get the tests. Um, but I've also been told that there is some issues with your health insurance paying for them. Um, and that even though they're supposed to be covered, there are a lot of people that are getting bills for thousands of dollars and the coding isn't getting fixed properly or there isn't a way to fix the coding. And so the health insurance is like, oh, well, no, you got to pay the bill. So they're not free. Um, and, you know, do you really want to pay for something that's only 50% accurate? So there's, there's kind of my take on the antibodies testing. Um, but that really is a decision that you have to make and you have to see if in your area you have ready access to an antibodies test. Um, I don't know if I'd be too confident in something that's, you know, only 50% accurate. As far as, you know, um, hazard pay for your employees, you know what, if you can afford it, um, I, I'm never going to say not to pay your employees more, right? I mean, we're low, it's a low wage earning industry in the first place. If there are funds available, whether it's because your state is giving you money um, because they're, they're supporting that, whether the CARES Act money, uh, stimulus money that the state is getting, they are redirecting it to child care programs, um, which a lot of states are, and you have that funding available. If you were able to secure a small business uh, loan or a PPP loan, and you're still collecting revenue as well, and you're able to pay your employees more, I'm all for it, okay? I'm always going to be for paying your employees more, okay? Um, I can't see the harm in it. What I will say is that you want to make sure that, let's say, and I'm going to do this just because this is what I know the grocery stores and Target has done. Um, my son receives $2 an hour. Um, they're not calling it hazard pay. They're just calling it a um, pandemic bonus or something. It is a separate line item on his pay stub and it is identified as this kind of hazard pay or bonus. So it's not in the main line item with his regular hourly rate. And the reason I'm gonna recommend that you do it that way is so that when you take it away, <coughs> excuse me, the employee doesn't have, have this argument, oh, that they were confused and they thought that that was just their new pay rate. That that is something that I did for my staff. I also have a separate line item specifically for hazard <coughs> pay. And um, before we started paying it, we did like a virtual staff meeting. I showed them a sample <laughs> yeah. of pay stub because I didn't want any confusion either. And it also is going to help <clears throat> I've been talking way too much today. Um, it's also going to help with overtime calculations because that wouldn't necessarily be um, part of their regular pay. <clears throat> so when you go back to their regular pay, it's not going to affect that overtime rate if for some reason the Department of Labor were to get involved in an audit with you, okay? As far as the other question about your hours, and your days of availability. I have a whole nother lecture to do tomorrow. I hope I'm not losing my voice. Um, as far as your hours and availability, um, the days that you're available, there is a trend right now that, um, you know, we are limiting instead of being open 6 to 6.30 or 6.30 to 6 like we were before, because the groups uh, in a lot of, um, licensing agencies are saying that you can't combine groups, that the children have to stay in their group all day, and that you have to limit um, how many staff members go through that group throughout the day, and we can't, you know, combine and, and break people like we used to, to limit um, and keep those groups as small as possible. A lot of centers are cutting back their hours, and they're going, to, you know, instead of being 6.30 to 6.00, they're now, you know, 7.30 or 8 o'clock to 5.30 or 6 o'clock, or even I've seen 5 o'clock is the earliest. Um, so that is a common thread right now. 
um, throughout the industry um, all across the country. Whether you should do that or not is going to depend upon your staffing availability and the licensing guidelines in your area about how you can, about minimizing group um, exposure and putting kids together and taking kids apart at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. And also your availability of staff to keep staff consistent throughout the day. Okay, um, so that we're not, um, that we're not over exposing people. The bottom line is, to be honest with you, once you're inside a building, everybody's exposed to everybody anyway. We don't have these huge fancy um, uh, air filtration systems that are going to, um, that are going to um, filter anything out. As far as the tuition, and this is, this is what we'll end with, um, as far as the tuition surcharge, I haven't seen this as a trend in our industry. And this is something that's just starting to peak up. I saw some articles yesterday and today about restaurants and um, stores adding a COVID-19 surcharge onto people's receipts, their bills um, for PPP costs and added cleaning costs and things like that. I don't know how this will play with your clientele, and that's something anytime you increase fees, um, that's something that as a business owner you have to personally wrestle with. I think some of you would be able to pull this off um, and add it into your bill and your parents won't really bat an eye too much. And then there are others of you that the parents will laugh you right out of business if you tried to do this. So again, this is a very personal decision. Um, <clears throat> if you are going to change anything about um, the fee structure or what you're charging parents, you should have them sign a new fee agreement, a new contract for services um, <clears throat> so that you are not in breach of the contract they originally signed to say that, listen, we're reopening. These are the new guidelines. This is the new way of, you know, way we're doing things and this is the new contract. Um, <clears throat> to make sure that you know you're you're above board and that they're informed as well all right um as far as like if you if you give the employees the two you know the the hazard pay the increase for this period of time or if you do a covid 19 tuition surcharge um since we don't know when this is going to end and we certainly have no idea if there's going to be another need to close and shut down in the fall if this peaks again and, and we're kind of everybody's just kind of rolling with it day by day i don't think you say anything like you know we're going to do this until this time um it's just temporary for now and and one of the things that you could say is while the public health emergency remains in place. That's good language because the national public health emergency or your state public health emergency isn't going to be rescinded or taken down until this is well in hand and over um, because those public health emergencies, whether it's the national one or your state public health emergency or major disaster declaration, if it if it is, uh, um, you know, if it's called that, and that's what it is from the national level, and all 50 states right now are under major disaster declarations. Those things are the the um, declarations that give the governor and the president um, legal authority to do all of these stay at home orders and things like that. So they're not going to take those down until this is this is well in hand and they don't need to use that power, that emergency power anymore. Um, so if you just simply say, you know, we're going to give you um, a COVID-19 $2 an hour bonus in your paycheck as a separate line item, and that will remain in effect as long as we can afford to do it and in, and while the public health emergency is in place, we intend to, to honor that. Um, since you shouldn't have contracts with your employees, um, and hopefully you don't to preserve your at-will employment status, um, you know, you can you can add that in and take it out and it, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, okay? I wish we had more time to go over more things. I hope we get to do this again. I, I'd be very happy to come back. Um, but you can always reach me um, through my website, through um, our 
um, Facebook page and the links were posted here to that. By emailing or calling with questions, um, we will get back to you and, and have a conversation with you. Um, that's kind of all we've been doing since the middle of March um, is dealing with um, not only our clients, but just programs all around the country, helping them figure out how to do this. Um, so you're welcome to reach out. And um, I hope to be back on here again soon with you, Danielle. Um, this was great. And yeah. sorry for my coughing fit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This was so much useful information. Thank you so much, Dawn, for being here. And for everybody else, like she said, you can be sure to check out their Facebook page. I have it linked right here, ECE Lawyer and Consultants. Is that right? Um, yes, that's the at, you know, um, the name yeah. of the page is Ronald McGuckin and Associates, but that's the at, you know, right. little tag right. that you can do. Yeah. Mm hmm um, and then for everyone still watching, be sure to join us next week, um, next week, Wednesday, same time, same place. And also on July 1st, we have Scott Wayman from Kangaroo Time. Um, if you guys are interested in that, you can go back to childcaresites.com to register. And please leave your feedback about this webinar by going to childcaresites.com slash feedback. Thank you so much. And we would love to have you back, Don, for a different topic. <laughs> no problem at all. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for watching this webinar replay. If you still have any more questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below, or you can reach out to me privately by going to childcaresites.com. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel. You can do that by scrolling down and clicking that subscribe button. And while you're down there, you might as well turn on the post notifications by clicking that bell icon after you subscribe. I host webinars weekly on childcaresites.com, so I'm definitely looking forward to next week's webinar with Shantae Lane and Rainey Frazier from Discovery Lane, who will be talking to us about how to create a distance learning program within our preschools. If you are interested in that topic, then head over to childcaresites.com. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.